Witchers, welcome back to the Witcher Lorecast. This is your host, Tom, or Robots. I'm here with Toasty, and as usual, we're diving back into some new lore about a different location that we haven't covered yet, the Isles of Skellige. Toasty, I'm excited for this one. This, the Isles of Skellige are actually very interesting, and we get a good look at them in The Witcher 3, but of mm-hmm. course there's more to to them than we see in the games. So uh, what, do you, what do you think about Skellige? Is it a place you like to visit? Well, in The Witcher 3, uh, I'm kind of like, it's cool, but it's also a pain in the ass. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of boating. There's yeah, a, you there's boat that. everywhere. It's kind of, uh, that's kind of a pain. But like the, 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 the culture and just the whole vibe of it is very interesting and, and fun. Um, and I know has like, I feel like it's the more relatable is not the term but like you know it's hard to kind of like pick up some of the stuff unless you do like the research for it as far as like the polish pools and stuff like that like we're not as like worse but we can go to skellige and be like this is like norse or like scots gaelic irish gaelic kind of like yeah pulling from everything and i can yeah i can more easily interpret Skellige as opposed to like a lot of other places sometimes as far as the Witcher goes. Right. I think we as Americans are a little bit more familiar with Irish or Scottish or Norse influences and culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, A a lot of people in the States come from those backgrounds, whereas there's much less of a Polish influence in the United States. So, um, yeah, I could I could totally see that. I totally understand that as well. Um, So here, let's let's start this off. Where do we start with Skellige? Uh, so Skellige, also known as the Skellige Islands or Skellige Isles, um, is an elective monarchy with a king or queen. Um, queen much more recently, as far as we're concerned. Um, the heads of government are the clans, with the military being run by the Jarl of Skellige. Specifically, that's the whole title, because there are also other Jarls um, and their troops. It is not stated that Skellige has a capital, but most consider Kerr trolled to be considered the capital. Hmm. Um, okay. It's not really, it doesn't really have like a specific one, but like Kerr trolled is where like you kind of show up at first with the large like castle. And right. Whatever. Right. It, playing through it in the games, I always got the sense that it was this, this kind of like collective of kingdoms that all just agreed to a certain sense of we work together as long as we all get along enough to do so. <laughs> yeah. There's the, a little bit of that going on. Yeah. There's like the different, like, I mean, it's, it's several islands. It's a massive archipelago, but um, there are like the specific bigger islands that are like kind of run by specific clans and then they kind of govern them stuff, but then collectively combine to form the islands of Skellige. Um the official language is Skellige jargon. Skellige jargon. Skellige jargon. Um, more on that later. Uh, the currency is the ducat, um, specifically from the union with Sintra, um, which we know well about. Or, yeah, well about. No, that's not right. That doesn't feel right to <laughs> words, say. Words is hard. I'm not going to hit the button. Um, uh, <laughs> but we, we, we get what you're saying. There there have been historical uh, pairings between monarchs from Skellige and Sintra and some other locations. Yeah, so of course. A very specific one we're familiar with from like the story of the dinner. So uh, and the Skellige pantheon is the dominant religion. Yeah. So they have their own religion. This is a mm-hmm. bit different from the rest of the, the kingdoms. Yeah. So different pantheon specifically for their their gods and stuff uh it's an archipelago of considered one of the northern kingdoms though is not mainland obviously um is a group of six islands situated in the great sea off the coast of Sintra and southwest of sadaris and verdin uh, it's legendary and famous for the unrivaled Corsairs and swift longships that sail many seas. Yeah, so Vikings, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Vikings, very Viking uh, culture, like we said before. Uh, its people are united under the king of the Skellige Isles, or considering what you do in Witcher 3, depending on your choices, could be queen, uh, who's elected by the Jarls of the seven major clans during traditional moots. 
In practice, however, the kings are from the same clan or at least related. Yeah, there's a certain sense of um, tradition. And even though there's voting, there's a large, uh, I guess, social requirement to come from certain backgrounds to even be considered. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yeah. So we know that like in the least in the Witcher 3 since uh, the old like king was croc on crate i believe and then he has passed away by that point and then you uh it's kind of an election process between our trials between his children so um sort of a uh lineage of family but you know i guess it could change if uh allowed if people wanted to vote for someone else um even though their relations with most of the North are always tense, they are longtime allies of Sintra due to the marriage between Queen Calanthe and Ice Tirsic of Skellige. After King Ice's death in the Battle of Marnadal, the Islanders concentrated their raids on the Nilfgaardian Empire in an act of revenge. Right, like, screw you guys, you took us out. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, you took our, our, our man, we're going to take out your, your locations on the coast. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean... It's as far as the uh, the impact that it would have had, probably not very um, <laughs> considering the, just the size of the Nelf Guardian army. But I mean, it could have uh, they controlled if this is, had been a situation where naval warfare had actually been a consideration for the, the Northern Kingdoms versus Nelf Guard, they could have played a huge impact in that. But Considering Nilfgaard just comes from the south on land to more land, there's not a whole lot of at play as far as naval warfare, unfortunately. Yeah. So. Yeah. I have a feeling they're not too stressed out about some raids along the coast. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the history of this area goes way back, right? We've got a little bit of info on pre-human ages and then the formation of the kingdom. And mm -hmm. like many of these other locations there was some stuff there, but not a whole lot of historical record as to what was there before the humans show up. And then of course yeah. kill everybody or enslave people and do terrible things. Yeah. <laughs> Which is usually the, the way things go. So as for uh, those pre-human ages uh, before the first appearance of humans, the Isle, the Isles were apparently inhabited and dominated by a and she elves who shared it with giants and ice giants giants and ice giants so mm -hmm. there's the co the cooler version of giants yeah so we know parts of Skellige are, are much colder than the other parts so differentiating um as for the formation when humans did finally come around to settle the isles it first divided themselves into the independent clans with jarls clan chieftains as sovereign rulers of their respective islands Mm -hmm. So each clan is run by a specific Jarl. And like I said, not to be s confused with the Jarl of Skellige, which is the, uh, the main war general, main Jarl, the, the war general specifically, that is oh. the military commander is the, the Jarl of Skellige. Well, oh, so, so the other Jarls in times of war fall like behind that specific Jarl as mm -hmm. commander in chief of the, of the military. Yes. That's kind of neat. Like, I wonder yeah. why, I wonder what, I, I don't think we have the history for this, but I wonder why that one in particular, you know? Yeah, it's, I mean, I would say it's also, it's just so confusing though. It's just like, you got the Jarls, but you also have this Jarl, who's not actually, like not really fulfilling the role of a Jarl. <laughs> it's so. the same title name, but different job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not yeah. confusing at all. <laughs> um. Thus, the petty yardums of Skellige, small in size, several times invaded by rising powers of the continent throughout the years. Most menacing of such invaders being Sidaris, whose kings made attempts at full insurrection. However, no one ever managed to conquer them. On the contrary, the threat of larger kingdoms and uncivilized barbarians from smaller islets further away caused the islanders to unite. 
Skellige then became an elective monarchy ruled by a king chosen from among the Jarls. Right. So it, like I was mentioning earlier, you have all these different islands and all these different groups who realize like if we band together, we can hold out against some of these larger kingdoms on the continent or these other smaller groups that are trying to divide us and take over our larger islands. So uh, the individual rulers were willing to acquiesce, I guess is the right word to having a king among them mm -hmm. yeah so and this i mean there's your answer though for the reason why they do have a like head uh military general that they kind of all fall under right because they all had to unite to fight back sidaris and other threats to them um as for and this is this is very uh funny just because we were so used to seeing how what all the other like major northern kingdoms did during like the northern wars and how they like played it to effect and most of them had a pretty big impact um but as for skellige they fulfilled the role like we said with uh committing like coastal raids against Nilfgaardian encampments uh as well as in uh 1263 during the first northern war they received refugees fleeing the conflict in Sintra after the capital was sacked that makes sense because they they were a you know a pairing of the monarchy there right the one of the two like they married into the leadership in a way so some of their people were probably there as well as part of the court and all of that so when Sintra gets attacked it makes sense for some of them to flee to Skellige because if you've got a boat it's probably safer to go to the islands than it is to just find another place where the Nulf guardians are going to continue chasing after you. So that makes sense mm -hmm. now. Uh, uh, but they that's didn't about it. <laughs> we, we don't have any info about them, like sending over soldiers to join into the rest of the military forces marching South. They just you know, raided stuff on the, on the coasts and those kinds of things. So yep. it's interesting. I, I imagine it was, uh, not very, not too much concern as for, um, that problem because like Nilfgaard doesn't have, uh, an official Navy and they would need one in order to, uh, combat the like Skellige, um, or to try well to take it over. Yeah. Trying to so. conquest the islands. They would need a way to do that, but that doesn't mean eventually they won't get one if they take over yeah. all of these other locations and the people who can make the boats and they have more men now for fighting and all of that. So I'm wondering if that'll actually end up playing effect into, um, like the next Witcher game, because I mean, we don't need to concern yourselves with these petty island raiders um, when they're not having much of an impact on your military and like you still have of course the rest of the northern kingdoms to dominate but by the end of the witcher 3 they can accomplish that and i think like I, i've stated before i think is the most likely course is that Nilfgaard will have dominated the northern kingdoms and so Will in the next game, will we start hearing stuff or somehow be involved with Nilfgaard, you know, drawing up an official military or something to go after Skellige? If Ciri sits on the throne, I don't think so at all. Um, right. But depending on how they go with, ow, I hit my elbow. <laughs> depending on <laughs> how they go uh, with that route as far as that go, Like, that's another thing is I think Ciri is the most likely. So I don't think that'll be a problem. Right. But unless in the case that it's not. Yeah. Or unless she starts out as the leader and then through the course of the game isn't anymore for some story yeah. reason. Right. Uh, yeah. And then Skellige, somebody else takes control and of course is to decide to start taking over stuff yeah. because there are there are more places north of the northern kingdoms we've talked about. There are other locations that we haven't really visited. They don't get brought up in the games. They don't really get mentioned too much in the books, but there are other locations up there. And then there mm -hmm. are there is part of the the continent further to the to the east east over the mountains. Yeah. So who knows if other factions show up or if the empire decides to start spreading into some of those locations and then we start hearing about these other places yeah yeah so um who, who's to say for sure on that but like specifically i don't think skellige will still have to, will have to be concerned with Nilfgaard still if siri is the one sitting the throne because um as we know she's descended from uh, or she has family with skellige because of the the unity between Kalanthi and Tearsack. So right. uh, she's pretty close to them. I don't think she's going to commit war against Skellige. Or, so. But maybe maybe there's a maybe there is like a peaceful uh, like bringing the two 
groups together. Yeah. Like I think that that is it maybe like we I won't raid and, and that, sack your your villages, but maybe you should just agree to let us, you know, control everything. <laughs> that would be yeah. that would be terrible. Maybe, I guess that would be up to her though to decide I that. I have as to well. imagine that Skellige is more of a like like Nilfgaard's like just let us say that we control <laughs> you, and Skellige's like all right, but don't actually do any like interact with us at all, and they're like. <laughs> okay all right Maybe we it's can fine try. it's <laughs> like, fine unless there's like a bigger bad that shows up and then all of a sudden they have the same mentality of like well we should we're willing to give up a certain amount of control to the empire in order to like maybe let us keep our culture let us keep our our local government but we'll we'll pay taxes to the empire if we can work together fight against this bigger bad that shows up there could be that as well yeah. So but this isn't a Witcher 4 speculation. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> let's move on because we, we, we know that they have emblems, right? Every every one of these kingdoms has like en- emblems and symbols on their shields and banners and all of that. So wh- what yes. do theirs look like? Uh, so and uh, this might be a thing for uh, uh, another episode to talk about each clan specifically because each clan has its own coat of arms as well. Um, but we're not going to get into those. The main overall one um, that is most commonly recognized is a that of a silver drakkar which uh i believe is a version of like a long boat vessel um uh, on either purple or blood red hmm. okay so yeah. boats it makes sense right yeah this is a boat Viking i mean people. islanders using a boat so yeah. um i think the the ones that i saw i don't i didn't even see ones that were purple i saw just blood red where it was just a basically a long boat on a on a red background red, a red um, field as they like to call it yes the red field right okay uh, so what what else do we know about these clans you mentioned that there's these other clans individual groups and islands and that stuff so a clan is a kinship group among the islanders giving its members a sense of shared identity and descent uh Skellige is divided into seven clans each seated on one of the archipelago's larger islands. At the base of each clan are kins led by a so-called bonds, in turn are then led by a clan chieftain called Jarl, or kins, sorry. <clears throat> okay. Um, again, not to be confused with the Jarl of Skellige. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, Every Skellige clan has its own insignia and characteristic colors that define it as a distinct group bound by family ties and age-old traditions. These colors also act as a distinguishing mark that lets warriors easily identify each other on fields of battle. They appear on clothing, sails, shields, and tartans. Um, And I'm going to list uh, all of the ones, um, including... uh, separate other groups um that aren't considered part of these major clans so we have clan brockvar clan on crate which probably the most familiar for which are three players uh clan uh demon diamond clan drummond clan Heyme. Heyme. Uh, h-e-y-m-a-e-y uh, clan Heyme. uh Tordorok, and then clan tirsak for those that are familiar with the books and Calanthe's husband was uh, of Clan Tearsock. Okay, and you said okay. there's some other groups as well. What are they called? Uh, so they we have the Vild Carls, the Crow Clan, and the Terror Crew. Terror Crew sounds like a really edgy band from the 1980s. Yeah, yeah I can see that. It also just reminds me of um, for anyone that's watched The 100, it just seems like one of the ones that would be in there. <laughs> Because they were all called crews, like the different like groundling uh, groups. Huh. Yeah, it's, had, like, it's weird that they're called a crew instead of a clan. Yes, because it's, uh, they're not a f- officially a clan, I think. They're just like a smaller, like kind of outlier group. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, a bunch of people who probably get together and just, you know, with some ships and just raid places. <laughs> it's like a gang. Mm-hmm. It caused terror. And caused terror with their crew. <laughs> they got that. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break. Thank our patrons and we will be right back. So don't go anywhere because we're going to talk about the rest of the people, more about the individuals who live there and their indiv- kind of unique religion that they've got going on. So mm. we'll be right back. 
Very well. Let us get this over with. Something has infested my vineyard. Mm hmm Great. Let me go prepare my something oil then. All right, we're in the middle of the show. This is where we thank out thank out our patrons. Thank our patrons and welcome to our newest patron, Mormon Milkman. Welcome to the Patreon. Uh, Mormon Milkman signed up as a lesson, a tier four lesson, and will be able to join us on our patron chat, which is next week, which is coming up on Monday the 29th at 9 p.m. Eastern. So if you'd like to join us, feel free to, you've got time right now still to join on the Patreon. If you are one of our lesson tier patrons or higher vampire, then let us know what you'd like to talk about. Jump on to the Discord, and if you are new, make sure you are connecting your Discord and Patreon accounts. If you just Google how to connect Discord and Patreon, it shows right up. So thank you so much for signing up, and big shout-outs to our higher vampires, Ben of Tamaria and Jared M. And if you are interested in joining us or getting ad-free episodes or cool t-shirts or any of the other things that you can do to help support us and for us to say thanks for that, go to patreon.com slash witcherlorecast and check that out. Also, if you want to help out the show, with a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That would be amazing as well. We'll read those out on the future or five-star ratings on Spotify or commenting on some of the more recent episodes where there's a little questions on Spotify now that say like, what'd you think about that episode? All of that stuff is helpful. Sharing it with your friends and family, that also helpful as well. All right, let's move on with the rest of the show. You smell of death and destiny, heroics and heartbreak. It's onion. Right, yeah. Yeah, Chad is talking about Mormon Milkman and how that name is legend. Legendary. Because there's a milk joke. That was good, Rob the Princess. I like that joke. So we're back. We're back, Toasty. So what do we know about the people who live here? They are different than some of the other places, right? Mm -hmm. Other than just like they are Vikings. Like there's a little bit more to it than that, right? Right. I'm sorry. I'm trying to see if there's going to be a... It's like... it. It's so weird. I may at any point have to sneeze. I, I can't. <laughs> I'm just going to keep going. I, I thought, like I thought it, you were like. I feel it there. I just feel it like lingering. Like, it, I don't know. Right. It's well, if you weird. sneeze, we'll, we'll deal with it. I thought you were like, yeah, it's this is so interesting. It's so weird. And I don't know how to process the information I'm about to share with you. But no, you're like, I have to sneeze. Okay. No, I, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a weird spot. Uh, uh, so <laughs> the inhabitants of these cold and windy isles are simply called the islanders by other nor northerners on the continent they are renowned as hard tough and decent individuals while at the same time frightening when attacking their foes they are a nation with deeply rooted seafaring tradition and although their harpers cannot compare to those in Sidaris in terms of the number of completed units a year, the Islanders' Drakars are feared throughout the waters of the North and South because of the rage and knowledge these people possess. The Islanders themselves proudly state that they have the sea in their blood. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they don't make as many ships, but the ships that they make are filled with warriors that are scary and frightening <laughs> and and know what they're doing with their boats and with warfare that's basically what this means right yes uh the people however are not only backward corsairs and plunderers as most continental powers see them quite a number of them are fishers jewelers merchants alchemists or other common professions and at least two examples of a classic mage are recorded marquard and Astrid Litnade Ace Girfin Bjorn Dots Tier. Whoa! Ace Girfin Bjorn Dots Bjorn's Doter. That wow. If that's not a Nordic sounding name, I don't know what is. There are uh, way too many characters in that in that last I name. I think because I think the with it uh I mean I'm not I'm not an expert in like uh Nordic languages, but I think the Bjorn's Dotir is a thing that like translates to like Bjorn's daughter. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. Kind of like a, you know, something, something daughter of Bjorn. Right. 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 Like, like we see this Anderson with, like, would be the son of Ander. Right. Like, uh, like, yes, it, it is yeah. one of those types of names. Yeah. Because we, we see that with like, you know, examples like, I mean, I'll use the Thor movies as an example. Like Thor is introduced like Thor, son of Odin or Thor Odin's son kind right. of thing. Like, yeah, I think that is, roughly what it translates as far as that um 
In contrast to the North, the Islanders are predominantly free and possess rights nearly equal to those of the Jarls and Kings who lead them as the gap between higher and lower classes is milder. I thought that was really yeah. interesting. No, that, that is pretty cool because we, as we've seen in some of these other kingdoms, the, the aristocracy and the commoners are very separate. Yeah. Like, Especially in like Redania, yeah, you know, like, Redania. Ooh. Oof. Yeah, like there, there are the people there, there are the haves and then there are the haves nots. Right. Uh, in this culture, it's like, eh, yeah, we follow this guy, but he's one of us. <laughs> yeah. And like, these are our leaders, but it's also like, you know, they're like they have the clan structure as like a family structure. So it's like they're just kind of a big family amongst other families. So, right. Uh, while being able to speak without a problem in the common speech, they have their own language the Skellige jargon based on the elder speech. That's so interesting. And it's based on elder speech. So mm-hmm. it, d- it goes all the way back to the elves. Mm-hmm. So I imagine that that's like my idea for that, because we know that it was the islands of Skellige were inhabited by the A and she, I imagine it's kind of that same process of like the A and she left behind all of their like, like ancient, like, you know, tablets and stuff like that. Right. And then when the humans settled um, on the islands, that's what they had to go off. And so their language developed from the writings and stuff that they found. I have to imagine. Yeah, that's a in really interesting thought that like the humans who showed up on the continent were not nearly as sophisticated intellectually or socially or when it comes to writing and language. Mm-hmm. And they got kind of a step up from the elven cultures that they squashed underneath them. Uh, that's, yeah. that's a really interesting perspective. It's one of those things that has happened in human history where one group will take over another group. And even though the group that they took over was more sophisticated and technologically advanced, it didn't mean that they were going to win the conflict. And then the groups kind of intermingle in a way with just one group more in charge than the other. But then the cultures move forward, uh, like the Sumerians and the Akkadians. I was just researching some stuff about them. Uh, really interesting stuff, how all of that stuff mingles over time. Cool. Many of the skulls that hail from the Isles utilize bagpipes. The inhabitants domesticated bears and utilize them in warfare. War bears, war bears, <laughs> war bears. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's wild. Um, on the Skellige Isles, women and men stand on legally equal footing and both train in the arts of war and seafaring. In practice, however, certain discriminatory beliefs still persist. It is much harder for a woman to reach a ruling position. As we see um, in the Witcher 3 stuff. Yeah. Which the conflict. You know, depending on what you picked below, I feel like probably the mass would the vast majority of people probably helped to get um, the daughter on the throne. Um, at least that's the, that's what she I would assume. She seems like the right choice, right? She seems mm-hmm. like the non-shady person. She, she seems, seems like, like the, the better choice. The better like, leader. Yeah. yeah. The more worthy, the more like the better kind of right personality to put on it. Right. Um, so, and hopefully, so maybe the next time we see a difference Assuming, you know, if we see anything about Skellige at all, I'm sure we'll get little lore bits, even if we don't go there. So hopefully maybe that's changed now. So, yeah, maybe we'll see an evolution of that or a change in society or a pushback against it. I mean, this is one of those things that you see sometimes where like society takes a turn one direction and then everything like the pendulum swings back the other way even harder. So who knows? Um, anything else about the people or can we talk about the... Uh, this pantheon that they they worship talk about the pantheon right, let's, let's talk about their religion so they have their own gods yes uh so the gods of the sea and the goddess freya are chief objects of worship throughout Skellige. um i think some people are going to recognize some of these names um because obviously this pantheon is uh pretty heavily based on on the norse pantheon uh like Freya. In the real world. <clears throat> the name Freya. Uh, <laughs> yeah. right there. Uh, yeah. There's some other ones there. Uh, undoubtedly, the latter is revered by the Islanders above all other deities, and she is a central figure in their religious system. They grant her the venerable title of the great Modron, meaning mother, in their tongue. 
for Freya is the patron of fertility, love, and beauty. She also poses as the patron of soothsayers, clairvoyance, telepaths, as symbolized by her sacred animals, the cat, which sees and hears while being unseen, and the falcon, who watches everything from the sky, and by her jewel, the necklace of foresight, Brisingament. Wow, there's a lot to unpack there. So, yeah, I mean, they, obviously they worship the gods of the sea. This mm -hmm. they're, they're an island nation. The sea is extremely important to them. But then Freya in particular, uh, this mother deity of fertility, love and beauty, being able to see things without being seen. And and so you have like soothsayers and clairvoyance and, and there's kind of this mystic quality to her as well. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the cat and the falcon. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah. Which I think kind of does blend a little bit. I think because like we don't have an an Odin in this pantheon specifically, but I know as far as like the Norse pantheon goes, Odin kind of fulfilled that role as far as like the like because he could see kind of everything. Like he was the clairvoyant like member, um, right? And the crows, kind of like the crows, were associated with him and mm -hmm. uh, being kind of intelligent, but also uh, shifty, <laughs> kind of <laughs> aware of what's going on, and you know. Yeah. getting into places they are not supposed to right uh apart from these the islanders revere the mythical hero himdal probably close heimdall. to heimdall yeah, yeah. uh his mistress hulin howlin h-e-u-l-y-n -E yeah yeah and their children founders of the most powerful clans and the first alleged rulers of the archipelago uh, grimyar modolf broader Otkel, Sov, and Tyr. Yeah, some of these, um, yeah, um, obviously there's a lot of connection to Norse stuff. I mean, we could probably go into the, the specifics a little bit more, but uh, yeah. If, you, if you're familiar with any of these names like Tyr are going to stand out to you and you're going to be like, oh, mm. I don't know who that is. Well, they also trust and believe in local druids, uh, which we get to see a lot in, in The Witcher 3, um, who are seen as wise men and act as diplomats, royal advisors, warriors, and wielders of magic. And we know we get to see this very specifically as far as the books go with Mausak, uh, mm -hmm. who is a druid, but also acts uh, as the the royal advisor to Ace to Tirsak, and then therefore to Kalanthi once he like or once their union is met. Right, right. So, and he goes by we talked about him. He goes by a different name among this the people of Skellige and mm -hmm. shows up later on in the in the games and all of that. Yeah. Uh, so there are also two forgotten deities, Svalblad and Melusine. Svalblad was worshipped by a cult cast out of Skellige, for even in a land of violence-oriented culture, these worshippers practice rituals so drastic that they repulse the minds of many. This is similar to some of the other stuff we talked about with the the... The people groups, uh, what, in Redania and Temeria? Remember that? Yeah, I'm trying to think. I don't remember their specific. names, but they, yeah, they worship these to... like these deities that were more more into like blood and warfare and terrible things that they get ostracized by the majority of the population. Yeah, I can't remember the name of that one. But yeah, no, I, I remember what you're talking about. Um, yeah, maybe. I mean. It got cat. They got cast out of Skellige. Maybe this is like those factions are like been come down from this particular group, um, and they're like uh, the members that got cast out before. Yeah. Well, this isn't something we've talked about very much in a world like The Witcher, where you have very powerful ancient beings and demons and all sorts of other things. Some of these gods may actually be real. Like some of these people might have been worshiping some sort of demon and they just had different names for it among different cultures. Could be a thing. Yeah. Um, when it got too far, Jarls brought an end to it. And by 1272, only the hinge in Fort Hala remained standing. So it's, it's kind of working out of the culture. Yeah. 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 Uh, Melusine was a siren but was so strong, large, and different from the others that some islanders worshipped her as a semi-divine being. 
She hibernated in a cave at the southern cliffs of Spikaroog, leaving it in at times to hunt. The locals feared her enough to worship her and even built a massive shrine in her cave, remembering her as the mad and dangerous Lady Melusine of the Depths. This sounds like a monster. Like, yeah, I think we, I think we fight her. Do we? Uh, do I we? think in The Witcher Three, I think oh, so. There is like a up. big siren that we fight. <clears throat> so that's the same. That's that is I, this person or I thing, think so. whatever they are. I I think so. I yeah. This sounds remember. kind sounds of like super familiar. It sounds kind of like the uh, the hags from Crookback Bog, right? Like that. There's kind of a similar thing going on there with like. It feels like an ancient evil spirit that takes on a form that's similar to things people recognize, but isn't quite the same. And like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe vibe. not. Maybe it's not. It's just, I don't know. It sounds because I know that there's like kind of a boss siren that we fight. And I, for some reason, Melusine sounds familiar, but hard to remember. Well, so. if you happen to know more about this one than we do, and we'll, we'll dig into it a little bit more because maybe, maybe this could turn into a whole episode about some really cool ancient yeah. characters that are worshiped as deities. Um, but that, that basically does it for Skellige. That's kind of the mm-hmm. overview. Any other yeah, thoughts, the, Toasty? Uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, it's just, it's very interesting and very different. I think from like kind of what we see with, with like the, vast overview of the northern kingdoms so they are it's always that that's always been very appealing like kind of culture to me uh as far as like theming and stuff goes um so it even though skellige is kind of a huge pain in the ass with all the damn boats it's still <laughs> really cool and interesting and <laughs> like very cool like step away from like the overall witcher as far as the witcher three goes so. yeah yeah bring your crossbow if you're getting on a boat <laughs> mm-hmm. bring your crossbow definitely bring your crossbow <laughs> awesome so awesome awesome well we'll be back next week with our patrons and we still have to talk about what we're going to be chatting about we have to set that up so if you have some thoughts on what we should discuss let us know especially if you were one of the patrons and um any other any th- other things you want to share toasty before we head out um as always, go check uh, me out with the Cyberpunk Lorecast that I do with my co-host Genesis, where we do very a very similar uh, overview of the world uh, like we do here, but in The Witcher. Or the, in <laughs> we do Cyberpunk the characters Witcher, no, we do, in The Witcher. I'm pretty sure there's a mod for that somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably. I mean, I've seen I've seen plenty of like like either like cosplays or like art or something of like witcher characters but in cyberpunk i mean yeah there's even like kind of the mm-hmm. the gen- i think generally accepted like idea of that one of the worlds that siri went to on her travels through the different worlds or spheres was uh the cyberpunk world mm-hmm. and she kind of talks about it so mm-hmm. yeah you know. And who knows maybe it all intersects even closer than we think uh but i also do the uh cyberpunk or cyberpunk red light play podcast to cyberpunk cyberpunk apostrophe d with the fumbling for an almighty crick gang awesome yeah go check that stuff up out check it up check it out words are hard uh you can look it up on whatever podcast you're listening to this on or you can go to robotsradio.net and find links for everything over there and you can find my other shows as well so if you're into lore stuff or any of these types of games there's lots of content by myself and toasty and lots of other creators for you to go check out so go take a look and thanks toasty this has been awesome and informative and a lot of fun as usual and chat thank you for being here and we'll be back next week so we'll see you then everybody until then, stay safe on the path All right. or in your boat in this case. Yep, with your crossbow. All right, we'll see you all later. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Witcher Lorecast. We'd love to hear about your experiences with the games and the books and the TV series and all your thoughts on everything. Please check out the Robots Radio Discord and follow us on Twitter at Witcher Lorecast. You've been listening to a Robots Radio podcast. Smart shows for interesting people. Check out all the shows at robotsradio.net.